Everyone wants to know which stocks are the best stocks to invest in. Well, today we're going to show you five great dividend stocks to hold. Now, this is based on a simple objective method that we've been refining over a decade. So we're experienced finance professionals, none of this 30-year-old life coach stuff. The methods described today are what made Buffett the wealthiest investor alive. So why reinvent the wheel? Now, we happen to be holding all five of these stocks, what they call eating your own dog food. And I wanted to start with this simple question. What's the single most important thing dividend investors should care about? So some people might say, well, yield or an increasing share price over time or that a dividend gets paid. Now, making sure the dividend gets paid is certainly close to the correct answer, but not exactly. The single most important thing a dividend investor cares about is that their dividend grows consistently over time to help offset inflation. So Buffett calls these equity bonds, and it's why he's on track to receive $6 billion in dividends this year. How did he do it? Well, let's start out with some assumptions. So first of all, human emotion has destroyed more wealth than anything else. So we need a rules-based system to overcome that. Then we need to consider the paradox of choice. So psychologists tell us the more choices available, the more difficult the decision, and the more unhappy you're going to be after choosing. So we want to make sure that we choose with conviction. So taking ownership over your own decisions is very important. You don't just follow what others say blindly. So our goal is to teach a man how to fish, then let him decide where to cast or a lady. At no black box guru gut feeling rubbish. So the method should always be simple and transparent. So since we all have busy lives, let's get on with it. Why dividend stocks? Well, everyone understands the idea of passive income. So you hold a stock, it pays you money four times a year. Now don't get caught up on timing here. So some stocks pay 12 times a year. Don't chase that. Just be a better budgeter. And don't try to purchase a portfolio of dividend stocks so that the timing adds up so you get the exact same amount of money every quarter. Just budget better. The amount of money that a dividend stock pays you is not important. The rate at which it grows is. Now, people will say, but Joe, I'm retired and the suits over at JPM say I can make 9% yield on a black box investment product they built called Jeppy. The reliability of that income stream is extremely important, especially to retirees. The more reliable an income stream is, the healthier it is, the lower the yield. So you always need to be suspicious of what they call yield traps. Don't try to chase yield. We'll touch on this later. So the importance of track record. If you're a hiring manager, you look for track records of achievement. So if somebody doesn't have a lot of work experience and you look at their academic track record, treat dividend stocks the same way. And I'm not talking about management teams, right? It's a given that management teams are the dog's bollocks. A track record of consecutive dividend growth demonstrates the financial discipline to weather hardships. Now, think about that. If there's a recession, do you really want your income to go away while you're watching the market implode? No, you don't. So what will happen with quality companies is that yield will provide a support for price. What do I mean that by that? Well, for example, people say, why doesn't J&J &J ever trade at a 5% yield? Well, occasionally, maybe when there's a very massive black swan uh, market dip, it might very briefly hit those high yields during times of turmoil when institutional investors step in and pick up those quality assets on the cheap. So that's what I mean by there's a support level there. So Here's a look at the timeline of U.S. stock market crashes from 1929 till 2021. This is from Investopedia. You can see over the past 37 years, there's been 10 crashes. Now, if a company can weather all of these crashes, they've been stress tested pretty well, right? The odds of them being able to weather future crashes, in other words, to keep increasing that dividend in the future, are pretty darn high. Now, what sort of a track record should we expect? So how many years minimum do we want to see them have increased their dividend? Now, we set the number at 25. That's because it's a widely accepted term used, dividend champions. That means 25 years or more track record of increasing the dividend, not just paying it, very important, increasing it. S&P Global, 
They call these aristocrats, except they're taking from a universe, which is the S&P 500. We want to look outside that universe at all U.S. stocks. People say, but Joe, what about a company at 24? Fair enough. But you need to draw the line somewhere. Remember that choice paradox? So you can certainly lower your threshold, but hold the line, whatever that is. All right. People say, Joe, what about a company that missed one year of growth? Well, did they keep it the same? If so, that's incompetency because one penny was all it would have taken to keep that track record. If they lowered it, that defeats the purpose. We want to make sure that we're consistently receiving more and more income over time to help offset inflation because when you get older, you don't want your quality of life to deteriorate, which is what happens when you're on a fixed income. The more years a company increases their dividend, the longer that track record, the better they look. Buffett refers to these as equity bonds. Now, this is important. The dividend increasing every year doesn't mean that earnings per share is increasing every year. That's a very important distinction. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But first, let's create a universe of stocks to look at. So as I said, S&P Global uses for their aristocrats a universe of the S&P 500. What we want to do is look at all stocks in the United States. So we've actually bought a data set from NASDAQ to do this. All stocks in the world you could consider. We're actually working on that right now, and it's a little more difficult. But for this exercise, let's start with all U.S. traded assets. So let's say 8,000 or so stocks. All right, second step, we want to eliminate small stocks. This reduces our selection universe, going back to that problem with having, having too many choices, increases stability, less volatility, and contributes to outperformance based on extensive back testing that we've done of this strategy, simple strategy. You want to create a market cap cutoff, and maybe you don't. So you say, I'm going to consider all stocks. Fair enough. We created a market cap cutoff and a buffer so that stocks don't just jump in and out of the universe every time we do a, a, a reevaluation of constituents. Now, stocks you're holding are excluded, of course. In other words, you could be holding perhaps a REIT and it sinks below your cutoff. Now, the only reason we would ever sell a dividend growth stock is if they stop increasing that dividend. So that's an exception there. Now, it's time to rank these stocks. Once we've decided, all right, whether or not we want to have a market cap cutoff, we've decided to. And ours is, let's say, somewhere around $10 billion. So that leaves us with around 88 stocks to choose from. We know these are quality companies. Now, let's rehash. We started with all stocks in the United States. We kept those with a track record of increasing dividends. Now, you could adjust that threshold to your own preference, but we decided 25 years or more. We eliminated smaller companies. You may not choose to do that. Um, we found size out outperforms, and these firms are less likely to blow up. Uh, we have 88 stocks to choose from, so we want to start by ranking them to find the five best stocks. Now, what do we care most about? Well, we talked about that earlier. The companies in our universe that can continue increasing their dividends. So we want to look at companies doing business in other countries, not just the United States. They're They'll be more resilient to foreign currency fluctuations or if the U.S. has some major problems. So large multinationals are seen as more desirable than their domestic counterparts. And when times are bad, payout ratio provides a buffer. So a lower payout ratio is always better. What's a payout ratio? Glad you asked. So here's a look at how you can simply calculate payout ratio. Let's start with profits of $20,000. So the percentage of that money that we decide to give back to shareholders in the form of cash dividends is 25%. If net income is $20,000, we pay $5,000 in dividends. That's a 25% payout ratio. On the left there, you see retained earnings. So the company can take that and reinvest in the business or buy back shares or whatnot. Now, here's a question for you. How much could earnings or net income decline before the company stops increasing their dividend? You might say, well, $14,999. That leaves them $5,001 for dividends. So they have a dollar more. They're increasing it. No. Earnings could disappear entirely, and the company could pay and increase the dividend from cash. So they can actually have a negative payout ratio, right? Because they could even go into debt, even if they don't have enough cash to pay the dividend. See, oil companies doing this. 
they can use debt to keep the dividend growth going. Now, certainly consistency of earnings helps out a lot here, and you want to see a consistent payout ratio over time that stays low to give them a buffer. So when we look at earnings, I love this statement, profits are an opinion, cash is a fact. You can fake earnings, but you can't fake dividends. Those are cash. So Yield or the cash that you get from an asset means nothing unless it's predictable because it could go away tomorrow. So searching for the highest yielding stocks makes no sense at all. You'll see these very large yields out there, and <laughs> that's based on something they just did. What's the likelihood they're going to continue doing that going forward? Dividends mean very little if they're random. So keeping that track record intact is very important. And what you'll see companies do is they increase their dividend by the smallest fraction allowable. Good example, Walmart. Uh, REITs do this as well, just so they can keep that growth record going in when times are tough. So third step here, we want to rank these stocks. So we're going to rank them according to the seven factors we talked about. Track record. Longer the track record, bigger the reward. Size. Bigger the company, bigger the boost. Payout ratio. We want to favor low payout ratios and penalize high payout ratios. That's starting to get dangerous, right? Even though they can use cash and potentially debt. But we always want them, whenever possible, to be paying out of uh, profits, right? Growth. We want to reward five-year and 10-year growth. But we want to penalize that if it's below inflation. That's the whole point. We need to be beating inflation, right? Yield. We're going to reward that up to a certain point, going back to that comment about yield traps. And then, as I said, international sales, we reward companies that sell internationally and penalize those that have heavy domestic exposure. What's the end result? The top five stocks that we've gone from 8,000 stocks in the United States down to the top five stocks based on the methods we just discussed are right here. So going down the list, you see Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, Chevron, Abbott, and Nordson. We happen to be holding all five of these stocks in our 30 stock dividend growth portfolio. And that's part of our strategy called Quantigence. It's recession proof. So say the average stock in that universe has uh, not only paid, but increased a dividend for 42.6 years. That's crazy, right? Remember earlier, we talked about all the um, market crashes in the, in the past 37 years. Well, they would have gone through all that. And then I think in our portfolio, we're averaging higher than that at 47. It's transparent and easy to understand. So we have a report for this, actually, and there's a link for it below this video. But um, what you can do is in that report, it shows you how to replicate this in Excel. So it's very transparent. It acts like a bond, pays like a stock, going back to Buffett's comment about equity bonds. 90% uh, of the long-term performance comes from dividends. It beats inflation and it beats the market. We'll talk about that in a second. So now what? Well, you have a universe of 80 plus quality dividend stocks. We decided to craft a 30 stock portfolio across industries because we wanted that diversification, but you can choose to do whatever you want. You can choose as many stocks as you like. You can tailor your portfolio to your own needs. And here's an example of our portfolio key metrics measured against the universe of 80 plus stocks. You can see we have a slightly higher yield there. What you could do is you could set up your own portfolio and cater it to higher yield stocks, right? So to, to boost that income, retirees may want to do that. Whilst uh, younger investors who have more time uh, may not be overly concerned with yield. But what's interesting here is if you look at 10-year dividend growth, so this is over the past decade on average our average asset has grown its dividend. Our income has grown by 8.8% every year over the past decade. That's remarkable. Here on the right, this shows you what an income stream starting at $1,000 per month. Let's say you had a portfolio that produced that. Here's how an income stream grows at 8.1%. So look, in year 30, you're getting over $10,000. So this handily outpaces inflation. Now, once you pick your stocks you can get on with life. So as Mr. Popeil says, set it and forget it. I'm telling you, watching the money roll in, it, it isn't just fun, it's exhilarating because what you're building is freedom in life to do what you want. Now, the approach we take is we sell dividend growth stocks in our portfolio for one reason only. That's if they fail to increase their dividend. They're gone. We'll find somebody else that will. Now, the question people ask is, well, if I um, 
purchase this report and I put together this strategy and start using it, why would I need you again? Well, that's fair enough. We thought about that. So things were developing around this strategy. We're doing an, right now an international dividend champions report. This is because for a lot of foreign investors, so half of you watching this are from outside the United States, you are going to run into problems with a dividend taxation. So uh, we're putting together international dividend champions report. We have a quantigence calculator. This is going to have uh, the universe of all stocks in our strategy, except we're going to remove that market cap cutoff. So you'll see small cap champions. And we also uh, perhaps will set a buffer there so that you can see up and coming champions if you choose to have a lower threshold than 25 years. We're also considering things like dividend alerts. You know, what, what raises am I getting every year? That's always fun to look at. So uh, people always ask consistently, does this strategy beat the S&P 500? And I, I'm happy to say it actually absolutely uh, trounces the S&P 500. That's covered in this next video. So um, please make sure to subscribe to this channel. Uh, share this video with anybody that you think could use uh, five good stocks for their portfolio. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.